HTTP Parameter Pollution It is a security bug that can easily go unnoticed. In today's microservices architecture, this type of bug can be more prevalent. My name is Pedram Hayati. I am a security instructor at a security education company called Secting from Sydney, Australia. In today's talk, I will be going through what HTTP parameter pollution is, how we can identify it, and more importantly, how we can effectively address this bug in our programs. Let me start by giving you a little bit of background information. Query in Uniform Resource Identifier, or commonly known as URI, is a series of field value pairs. Some characters are reserved and have a special meaning. Things such as question mark, equal sign, or ampersand. For example, question mark is a start of the query parameters. Ampersand will separate out different fields. Now, by having that in mind, what is the value of action? in this given URL is the value transfer or is it withdraw or none of them or all of them well the answer is it depends it depends on the technology stack that we are using for our programs and I have an example of them in this table PHP with Apache server in the front will interpret the first occurrence of action field. Java, using a Spring framework on the other hand, will return the last value of action. And in JavaScript, we will receive an array containing both, both values. And this is the same story when we're talking about Python, Ruby, Golang, and many other frameworks. What is the problem? The problem lies in the, well, RFC itself, which does not mandate how to interpret multiple query parameters with the same field name. Now, apart from obviously some functionality type bugs, what security problems can we face? Well, as you could imagine, depending on the program or the middleware that we are using these different interpretation can result into authentication bypass, authorization bypass, and quite commonly validation bypasses. And can, you can imagine in today's microservices architecture, we may have different technologies and by them different programs written in by different programming languages, uh, sorry, in different programming languages and they may interpret different parts of the input and they send that across and this can result into obviously some functionality but more importantly some security issues. Let's look at one real world example or incident of this issue which goes back quite, quite a lot to the time where we had a thing called open source web application firewalls. Well, firewall was a, a buzzword back in the days to something that we can put in our networks to protect our programs. Open source of application firewall or MOT security was a popular web application firewall that was looking at the traffic that was coming inside the program and goes out of our programs and was checking that traffic, most commonly HTTP traffic, for common blacklisted patterns. Within mod security, there was a rule set, and I should say mod security is also still available today. There was a rule set that was checking if this incoming traffic is, may have some suspicious payloads inside. And if it will mark or stop that traffic before that request will reach our program. And similarly, mod sec was also could be set up to look at the response traffic. And by looking at, for example, if the response traffic contain some uh, stack information, some detailed errors, MOTSEC will 
block those traffics as well. Supposedly, if the attacker we have a program which is vulnerable to SQL injection, an attacker wants to enter a payload to receive or dump all the user table. So in example, you can see here, attacker wants to enter select username and password from user's table. Obviously, Modsec will stop these type of patterns because it's a clear example of SQL injection. Now, if the same attacker break down the payload into multiple fields, all with the same name, and here in the example I have in the slides is, the field is page, we have that payload broken down in multiple payloads, all with the same name, but with the different values. It turned out to be that Modsec will only looking at the first occurrence of the page parameter or the field that is being recurring in the query parameters. And we'll happily allow that to go in because that field did not contain any suspicious pattern. However, the program, which is vulnerable to SQL injection, may interpret that differently, concatenate all those fields value together. And here we go, attacker was managed to bypass this bug or bypass this validation better sense so why we have this problem well the problem goes back to the way that the programs are interpreting this situation or http parameter pollution in other sense that when a request parameter with the same field name is interpreted differently the root cause behind this type of attack is is that we typically in our microservices architecture or any type of programs, you may have a component A or a type of a component or a gateway type component that sits in, in front of our program and typically does validation or verify for something. An example I have here, if we, our program receive or our environment receive a, a get request with two value bar and bars for the same field foe, the component A will perform the validation and depending on the technology stack used to develop that program, BAR or BAS or BAR and BAS may get validated. And then later on, this component will send this value down to other microservices or inner functionalities in our program. And again, depending on the classes, depending on the methods or libraries that we are using, different values will be interpreted. Let's now start talking about how we can detect HTTP parameter pollution in our programs. I will talk about two common ways that you can go and find this bug. One through runtime analysis or black, black box type assessment. And then later I will talk about how you can find this bug when you do a static code analysis or you do white box type assessment. This bug is relatively easy to detect during runtime analysis. We can simply just duplicate the parameters in the query string and see how the program will respond or which one of these fields was interpreted by the program. Now, the interesting part is that you can do the same thing with things like post requests. You can look at the post body and duplicate those parameters that you see within the post body. Now, more interestingly, you can do the same thing with the HTTP request headers. There are some important request headers such as authorization header, which typically contains authentication tokens, commonly JWT, or cookie headers, with again, which have, have some sensitive value. See if you duplicate these headers, rather than sending one authorization header, supply the program with multiple authorization headers, one with a, a valid, say, authentication token, the other one with invalid signature, but a valid user ID, and C, you may be able to get access to someone else's account by duplicating the authorization header because you may find that the program environment is set up that the validation is done 
by a different service and that service may only look at the first occurrence of the authorization header but not the second one and similarly we can do the same thing with cookie when it comes to the static analysis you can look at those parameters that obviously coming from an untrusted source and you look at if this parameter being passed around in the environment or being passed around to the other services and more importantly look at if the value or the if the original parameter being passed around or the interpreted value if the original value is being passed around there is a high likely that http parameter pollution can happen now i would like to stop talking and talk about the demo and go through all these things that we just talked about and to see in action what http parameter is how we can detect it and later on talking about how we can prevent it the demo program as you can see you can find it on gitlab.com slash secteam slash lab slash js http parameter pollution and i will go through that with you now this is our demo program let me talk a little bit about the structure of this demo so it's a broken JavaScript. What I mean by broken JavaScript program is a program that is vulnerable to HTTP parameter pollution. And to run this program, you can just simply clone first this repository after you forking it and uh, just run make build. This will build the, the program. It install all the libraries and dependencies. And then once you run make run it will run the program and we will go through the rest of it later the program has two main directories uh, you can find the program itself within the source directory if you look at the app.js that's uh, the main logic of the code and you, we can see here it expect a get request on root and within there it will look at two query parameters one called action the other one called amount and then later on we'll pass this to a, a component or sorry the method called payment which does some action on these two all right on line 24 we can see that the program expect to receive value transfer within the query parameter action i will not go through the details of the code at this stage the other thing for us is interesting to know is the test directory which contains two types of test uh, app.test.js contain the typical usability test app security.test.js are example of some security unit test at this stage we are not going to look at the details of it so okay now let's look at our program and i have already cloned this the program here i've already done make build let's just run it again is already ran build and set up all the dependencies i will run this program now now as we can see the server is listening on port 8080 let me start sending a request to our program it runs in localhost on port 8080 then i will give it a an action parameter with the value well transfer as we could see in the code following with amount field with say a value 100 and let's see how the program will respond as we can see it successfully transferred 100 dollars now what will happen if i change this transfer for example to something different let's put it let's do something different called withdraw as we can see the program responded that you can only transfer an amount so this program is expected to only receive a, a transfer action and there is a validation within the code that does that now if you remember we talked about parameter sorry http when we were talking about http parameter pollution we talked about duplicating these query parameters let's see what will happen if i duplicate the action uh, parameter let me change it to the original transfer and now i want to enter another action field with a different value this time but i cannot simply send this this will not 
run because due to the way that you know my my shell script is my, my shell environment is set up i need to do a little bit of change here the first thing is that i need to find the url encoded value of the ampersand to do that you can just look at the ascii man page sorry i didn't spell it properly and i can look at the ampersand here and i can see it's equals to 26 in hex so going back i can enter a url encoded or percentage encoded value of that and that is the equivalent of ampersand and let's see what will happen here well successfully withdraw a hundred dollars so this is just to show us that yes the program is interpreting the second value now when we are giving a duplicate action field now is the time we go back to our source code and see what actually happens so if i look at the source the app.js right on line 24 there is a check that is being done to see if this action parameter includes the value transfer okay that's that's firstly you may say that okay this is a quite a weak check because it will look at inside any part of the query parameter to find transfer and in this case because transfer was there and also withdraw because transfer with the, this if condition is true then it will go to the second line which sorry the line 25 which will pass the value that original value which i was talking about not the interpreted value the original untrusted value to this other method let's look at the content content of this method which is inside the file called payment.js and supposedly this could be a you know another service uh, or another inner program within our in within our setup and it's expected to do both withdraw and an action so these are just some dummy code i put here so if it checks if the action contains the you know the word withdraw it will does the withdraw for us it's kind of like a fake withdraw or if the action contains the word transfer it will does the transfer for us now the way that this program is set up is that the payment does not care what action the user wants. this is the job of the the app app.js the main program to perform the validation and only allow in the authorized actions so now i guess you already got an idea that what is the problem and what, where, where the issue is now let's talk about how we can address this issue like can i just go back can i do something here that effectively address this bug let me let me talk talk about that a little bit later but for now let's go back to our slides and uh, talk a little bit about how we can prevent this sort of bug i commonly see like as a security professional we do not really talk in lens how the programmers need to go and fix these bugs properly or in the majority of the cases i've seen that you know there is a link given to an online resource and we expect our programmers to go there and figure out what is the best way to fix this bug but unfortunately over these many years that i was in this field i could see that this has resulted into even more bugs because in in most cases these uh, generic type recommendations are incomplete and may contain loads of information that is not even relevant to our to our developers and a lot of times what will happen is we will see that these type of bugs are just address using type a like a band aid type type approach or just symptom type approach they just go there and let's let, let's let's just again look at the example they may just go there and they just put uh, let's just um, mark this issue come on this issue and maybe may just add a, a, a more a stronger check right here so re request.query that action triple equal transfer well you may agree with me that this will address this issue however this is not addressing the root cause of the, the problem the main problem of this program which is inherently secure so tomorrow if someone comes and adds another endpoint here or introduce a new controller 
they need to also make sure that all these checks or security checks are there and as the programs become more complex as the programs are starting to interacting with different different services you can see commonly these checks are either being is skipped or in another another sense it just makes the program ugly it makes the the readability of the program quite hard to to handle so I was over and over thinking, could it be an approach or could it be a different way of thinking here that we, it can guide the programmers with, a, with an approach that it will never result to problem like this in the first place. So can we think about a way that we program or a guide or a principle that it will not even result to a situation like this that later on we need to, to put a patch on it? Well. It turned out to be, yes, there is a way we can, we can do. And uh, there is a programming approach known as defensive programming that has been around to build robust safety critical application. And interestingly, secure programming is also a subset of defensive programming. The, the promise of defensive programming is that it guides us is an approach that plans for contingencies or unforeseen errors or in our case runtime exceptions where security is a runtime exception it tries to plans for them in the design and implementation stage of the program and in fact the concept of defensive programming or defensive design has been around in other industries for very long time for example if you live in australia or new zealand or some pacific islands this is what you see on the wall this is a power wall socket and depending on the amps there is a different design of this socket the this design or this defensive design enforces the user like me only plug an appliance with equal or lesser current rating to the to these plugs which obviously if we didn't have this defensive design a user may connect an appliance let's say with 25 amp to a wall socket which only gives out 10 amp and that could result into well short circuit or, or fire. So defensive design was inherited, was inside this, the, the, the way that these guys have designed the wall socket. Now, when it comes to defensive programming, my work uh, recently has been on expanding on the security aspect of the defensive programming. And uh, rather than focusing on vulnerabilities, over top tens or all those sort of common type bugs and then going to the programs try to patch them I was trying to collect and come up with uh, different design patterns and principles that can guide the programmers to write the program secure from the get-go at the same time handle the complexity of a number of security bugs uh, by following a principle this is, this is something we haven't even discussed in this, in, this, in this talk, but some of the bugs are not that easy to patch just due to the nature of it. At the same time, the other thing is how we can bring in all those runtime exceptions earlier in the development phase of our program. So we can plan for it, we can, we can think about it and fix it at that stage. And interestingly, some of these design patterns or principles can implicitly address many other classes of security bugs. Uh, I have divided these principles to you know, different categories of core and supporting, and I'm not planning to go through them in this talk. This is itself in another talk. But for the sake of the demo examples that I have, I will go through a few of these principles just to see how we can address a bug similar to the HTTP parameter pollution. And you may, you may also agree with me that some of these principles 
not just addressing the bug, but even if someone didn't know about HTTP parameter pollution, they could address this, this issue. The first principle, untrusted data validation. This is commonly known as input validation. And, you know, there is technically it will address the bug. However, when we are dealing with a complex program, an enterprise type program, it is not enough. And this is like the promise of the other principle to make sure this uh, program is robust in those situations. So untrusted data validation is simply about making sure when the data, sorry, the data must be validated as it crosses the boundary between untrusted and trusted environment. Now, if we look at our program here, let me just sh shift here. Uh, within the demo, we have another uh, branch called patch, which there is a sample, sorry, check out patch. There is a, you can find a, a sample patch for this issue. The first thing is within the patch program, you know, we haven't touched our, the, the test. So the test remain, remain the same, was app.test, security.test. But within the source directory, I have made some changes right here. The first thing, let's just look at the app.js to see how a patch example gonna look like. The first thing you can notice here is uh, we are defining two constant. One is called action, the other called amount. And it's coming from these two, which later I will talk about data types called action and amount, and that's it. And then later on, I will pass these validated values to our payment method for, for the rest of the program. If you look at the action and amount, they are all defined in a separate files, uh, and I call it types. Let's look at the action as an example. So what I've done here is I have defined a, a new type in our program. And the type is, is action. Now, if you think a little bit, the way that action was defined in our broken example, action was defined as a string. And in a lot of programs, a string is not a good representation of this concept. And this goes back to, I don't want to make it more complex. This actually goes back to domain driven development where it encourages to model your program as close as possible to the reality of this program or the business context of this program. When we define things as generic, like a string or integer or number, Although they can, you know, they can do the work, uh, they can model something from the reality, but it's not as close as possible. It's not as strict enough that what we mean by action in the real world. So in the context of this program, action is, is a type that can only contain two values, transfer and withdraw. And that's it. It is not a string. It's not integer. It's not even an enum. Action is action. So by having that, by modeling our program in this way, by just following the business context, or better to say the domain rules, we can enforce these checks without even thinking about the, the, the security problems or security things that may, may arise. So in this example, the first thing I will check is, well, obviously if my value is a string, by default is a string. And the other thing I, pretty much check that if this value that I have is contains the, the, the value, so the field contains the value transfer. And that that's pretty much it. With the exception of the line 16, which I'm doing, this is a specific to JavaScript, I'm making sure that this uh, type that I have is immutable. With the exception of that, you can see all other checks that I'm doing, there is nothing related to the security here. These are pretty much my domain rules. So as a programmer, if I was designing this, if I just listening to my domain expert about, hey, what action means in the context of this program, then I could simply apply these two checks and surprise, this will also address implicitly the problem with the HTTP parameter pollution in this example. Let's also look at our amount data type. It's similar to the previous one. However, again, in weekly type, 
and also dynamically typed languages, one of the first things we need to do, we need to convert or the, the value to the type that we expect. And this is what I've done on line five. And specific to the JavaScript, we also need to immediately check that if this value, this uh, number value that we have is not a number or, or not. I'm not going through the detail of why I did use this number that is not, not just is not itself, but this is just making sure these first few lines that, okay, what I'm receiving is a number type. And then I will apply my domain rule, which is saying in our case, okay, I'm expecting to receive an amount or my program should process an amount, which is between one and I guess 10 million. And that's it. And obviously this last line is just making sure my type is immutable across my program. It just makes it beautiful and it stops unexpected changes within our code. So having these two, let's also look at our payment service or payment method. As you can see, I have not changed anything here because the, this issue is not, it should not be even addressed at this stage if we are expecting the our gateway program or the action is the place that all the validation should happen payment should just be as it is maybe it's a different team in the company is actually working on it and may expect you know receiving values like withdraw from another components from another service so we are not going to go there and fix it although you the, the first you know gut feeling will be oh let's just go and fix payment but in reality in our case once we done these changes to to the our main program. Uh, sorry, here. Let me just quit this and run the tests again and see what happens. So let's just rebuild the program. Sorry. Okay, and uh, one thing that I forgot to mention at the beginning was we have two sets of tests. One is our typical usability test. The first this test to just check if the program you know, function as expected. So in the first, uh, well, in the second test, it will check if there is a request to transfer 100, it should return 200 with a success message. And if there is a request to withdraw $100, the program should return 400 with an error message. Now to run this test, we can simply just run make test and it's already done the test nothing failed here. The other sets of tests are our security tests. And in this example, this security test effectively does exactly what we did during the runtime analysis. It, it's request to transfer and withdraw $100 and expect to that program handles this with, 100, with 400 error. And as you can see here, we are, we are passing a query parameter action with the value transfer percentage 26, which is a URL encoded for the value and percent following with withdraw. So let's run security test. Let me clean the program again and hopefully this will show our test will rerun again. Just running the cached version at the moment. All right, so make test. Let it run for a while. Okay, the dependencies are set up. Copying the source, copying the tests and running our test using and we can see the test is passed with no issue. And similarly, the security test. And hopefully the program, yes, gonna pass. Let's just, you know, test it together as well. So again, I got the program and let's just send the same curl command that we did previously. And let's see what the program gonna respond. Obviously I didn't run it, so let's run the program. And uh, uh, let's just see what happened. I oh, yeah, make build, obviously. 
and uh, copying the build image and then run perfect we got that running and here let's run the care chroma yes and our program and nicely handle the http parameter pollution that was that pretty much that i wanted to talk about i hope well i cannot cap and answer your questions in this recording but hopefully by the time this recording will be played i will be there to answer your questions i hope this was useful the the intention of this talk was not so much talking about another vulnerability or another bad thing that can happen and get exploited but more around how even some widely known type bugs are not that uh, trivial to address or in our complex program or complex environment these bugs even are even harder to to address the thing about this program that i have here if you see when i define new types these types can be easily shared around with your with your other services within within your environment so everyone can make sure all those services can make sure that they are applying the consistent validation on on these uh, yeah, these parameters that you're dealing with one thing i want you to live with is that the, the, this idea of defining custom types was also nicely captured in a book called uh, secure by design and uh, there are the authors are talking about domain primitive which is effectively similar to what we just said we define a custom type or in another in a domain driven development sense we define a value object and finally here are some references and if you want to find me or contact me these are my details if you're part of sectalks you can definitely find me on sectalks.slack.com and that was it thank you very much and see you later